I like him. Yeah. He's inherently likable in literally everything I've ever seen him in. I want him in the next trailer for the Skywalker's new groove, right? <laughs> yeah. To, to go do that thing from Scooby-Doo that won him best fart in the Kids' <laughs> Choice Awards. <laughs> He's just sitting there in like an in- intimidating Sith outfit, and he just starts doing that thing. Um, and uh, Chewbacca's like, "Oh!" No, Ray walks in and is like, "Are you challenging me?" It's Chewbacca and Matthew Lillard doing yeah. a fart contest, and then Ray walks in. And it's just like awkward. Whoa. What? And then Ray farts because girls can do whatever they want to. Finally, <laughs> when is a girl gonna win best fart at the Kids <laughs> Choice Awards? It's 2019, people. <laughs> Best burp. No, that w- a woman will win that at the Academy Awards first. <laughs> <laughs> they keep adding new categories. Yeah. <laughs> Best popular burp. Uh, Best burp in a popular movie. Uh, but yeah. But today's movie has <laughs> hardly any burps or farts, but it does have Matthew Lillard in it. And that's 1996's Scream, directed by Wes Craven, here on the Spectator Film Podcast, everyone. Hello, I'm Max. And I'm Austin. Yeah, we're doing Scream. This is my pick. Uh, I love this movie. I really do. It doesn't hold up as well as I remember it, but just as a really brief intro to my history with this movie... When I was getting into horror movies, as I've talked about many times before on this podcast, in my teenage years, I watched mainly monster, surrealist, body horror, stuff like that. I kind of missed out on a lot of slashers. I watched them, but they weren't really my thing. Um, I started revisiting them, not because of this movie, but when I saw a movie called Behind the Mask, which I think does a much better job of deconstructing the genre. But yeah, we're gonna try not to compare those two too much. Yeah, I just I thought I'd bring it yeah, up. Yeah, it's mostly favorable. It's it's a recommendation moment. If yes. you like Scream, check out Behind the Mask. It's a little bit more sophisticated. It's a little bit like uh, we've talked about this off like off air, but like it's kind of like Best in Show, yeah. the Christopher Guest movie, except you're following like a stalker villain as he's preparing for his big like showdown with the teenagers to the point like, yeah. And like, he's likable despite the fact that he's like going about murdering. all yeah. these, Like it's a really good performances in that movie. It's fun. It is. And Zelda Rubenstein. Yeah. So go yeah. watch behind the mask, but that's the last comparison, but that made me go back and revisit the slasher genre. And also was the first time I'd it's like ghost face was iconic when I was growing up. Just that mask. Yeah. I would argue more folk, more so because of the plague that, of the scary movie movies, but um, oh wait, the first one was about Scream, wasn't it? Yeah, huh? Which it yeah is. Well, if you want to talk about movies that have burps and farts in them, <laughs> yeah, I'm oh. Paris Hilton. <laughs> <laughs> I think that is lowest common denominator comedy, where it's just like look a celebrity. The weird thing is, if you see that and you're like from a different country and you have no idea, it's got to be like the most surreal, like Louis Spoonwell thing, where you're like, I have no clue what this is. This is brilliant because it defies our like symbolic laws of language, yes. and there's no like signification going on. It just defies any sort of uh, like organizing system. But yes, please continue. Uh, but I saw this <laughs> and I like this movie for deconstructing and accidentally reviving the horror genre at a time when it needed it. I like a lot of the performances in it. Um, a couple noticeable are kind of eh, but we'll get into those during it's the It's buoyed by a few solid actors. And it's, an o- it's overall a good cast. I think it's a fun time. I like the 90s radical lingo just because i find that oh you got to say that right radical um I, I extreme say, that okay extreme you hit yeah. it perfectly with radical you've got to like draw it out gnarly um gnarly radical i love that 90s era type thing matthew litter was also in the best example of a movie like that called hackers um Excuse me, the best example is not even from the 90s. I don't think you've seen either of these movies, actually. I'm going to out you on this. It is excellent. It's Bill and Ted. I haven't seen any of the Bill and Ted movies. Oh, man, you are. Roast me, audience. They're roasting you out of love. Yeah, no, I want to see them. Yeah, you would love those. But, so yeah, I like this. I think this movie 
stumbles somewhat with its source material, but I think that's a result of it taking on goals that it wasn't completely prepared to handle. It is ambitious. And also, yeah. as much as I love Wes Craven, and I think he did a fairly good job directing this movie, this is one, obviously past his prime, and two, when you have a stake in the genre that you're parodying, you're not going to go as hard on it as you might otherwise, and I think that's part of the reason why. You mean in terms of his legacy? Yeah. And his like, identity as a creator? You're not gonna, I could say that, maybe. You're not yeah, going to drag the genre through the mud completely if you're one of the people who helps prop up that genre. So. Yeah. I mean, it takes it takes real self-awareness and honesty and, and, you know, like a lot of introspection to be able to pull that off really well. And maybe you're right. Yeah, maybe it's, I mean, that's I that's a challenge for anybody, yeah. I'm sure, to be able to really do that in the most effective way. And yeah. I think he did a pretty good job with it. And I would, I love this movie, but I would say yeah. it's a pretty good movie. He definitely made a movie that was, you know, successful in terms of like, you know, accomplishing certain things that it set up for itself and like executing on a premise in a way that people hadn't seen before. They obviously had an idea, right? The Kevin Williamson script. He, yeah. You know, he got the script and I think it was a good pairing between the two of them. They sort of got the idea of what they wanted to go for. Um, and you're right. I think they executed on it. It's just maybe when you watch it now, there are certain things that like, it feels like it's lacking maybe once the novelty of it wears off a little bit. So that makes sense. Do um, you want to just go over your history real quick and then we can dive in? Yeah, I uh, I can't remember the first time I watched this movie. I was pretty young. It was definitely before I was really into slasher movies. I, and I think I can speak for both of us when I say that we started our interest in horror movies more from a um, from the like perspective of a young teenager slash kid who is into like weird cool things like aliens or monsters yeah De rather than for me just men in tights stabbing to people <laughs> uh like i we were both like i did like a clockwork orange in my teenage years so that might not be it but. i'd say that's like its own thing yeah. that's a little bit of a different situation but you know i i think that seems normal to me i like i was a big dinosaur guy as as a kid yeah, like you make course. the transition to a certain type of horror and it's maybe a little bit more fantastical than than slashers um so with this movie i i stumbled into it more in that phase of my movie watching career um and i enjoyed it at the time i thought it was like clever and it was fun i think i enjoyed the mystery nature of it uh, i responded to um however i went quite a while without really revisiting it i think it was a little bit even at the time, I felt it was like light as a feather. Um, and then I watched it again for my horror project, my legendary horror project, yes. however, like two years ago now. And uh, I I didn't really enjoy it as much, that I, not that I was really expecting to. It was just, it had been a while since I watched it, and it came a little bit back down to earth for me. Um, of course, I might not have had as much of an opportunity to really digest what I was seeing, given that I watched over a thousand other movies. Yeah. Um, but this time when I watched it, I'm kind of on the fence because I know that it accomplishes certain goals, but I know definitively that I don't like it. And I'm teetering on the line of saying this movie is not good, which I know would be surprising to a lot of people because a lot of people really love this movie. And I acknowledge that, except I think watching it now, I think it, in its approach to trying to comment on the horror genre reduces certain things about the horror genre to such a basic and elementary level that now it is like putting a ceiling on what it can actually do as a movie. And because I think it is so reductive in certain areas, I think it really handicaps itself and enable itself to become something that's like smug and kind of pretentious, but also mixed with its attitude towards sex and women is perhaps unintentionally reactionary and I'm not going to go so far as to say misogynistic, but not like a sex positive twist no, on slashers. It's definitely not. And yeah, when, when you're carrying that from the genre, you're trying to parody. It's like, you have to be smart about it. Yeah. And yeah. You could have done a lot better with that, but these are, I don't think we don't have a lot of differences. It's just more of like how it affects us yeah. more. I think we, pretty much agree on like what they were trying to do with everything and 
whether or not they were successful with it. But I just think it's a good case of how this movie hits us. And yeah, I think that's some of our best tracks as well. Yeah, it, it is definitely an interesting movie because it's so tied to its time and place. Like yes. this is very late 90s. Um, it's definitely would be an interesting movie to do like surveys for, to be like different people at different ages, be like, how do you respond to this? Watching this at this point in your life? Or even like, did you watch this when it first came out? You know, like, I feel like the novelty of this is a big role in like the experience of watching it. And I think it's definitely the type of movie that plays really well in a theater, you know? Yeah. Um, and that's something that I don't think either of us have. No. I mean, I, we, I don't think. I, was, I know I was neither of us have. four, so when this movie came out, so <laughs> yes, good and times. I, and I was a, a fetus. So, uh, you know, I got to see Eyes Wide Shut in theater, but that's a different story. Um, <laughs> <laughs> what? <laughs> we'll go over that when we do Eyes Wide Shut. Okay. Um, the only s- movie in this series I got to see was the fourth one. No, I... I and I don't even rem- remember anything about it. I would not recommend any of the sequels. But to I this. do remember uh, the first time I watched this that maybe I should just mention it in the commentary. I have a crush on Courtney Cox. <laughs> don't we all? Yeah. But uh, anyway, are you ready to go? I am more than ready to go. It's going to be a scream, baby. Lift off. Here we go. Dimension Pictures. Dimension Films. Sorry. I always knew them as being the people who did the Spy Kids movies. Ah, uh, yes. I wish a thumb thumb showed up in this. <laughs> you should do every Spy Kids movie one Look day. at that text. I love that text. <laughs> Just kidding. No, I don't. It's a very yes, 90s text. Uh, but here we are, 1996. Mumbo number five is out. I don't know if that's true. Um... <laughs> But we have Drew Barrymore, uh, who I think gives the most underrated performance of this movie, by the way. Yeah, well, she is only in it for a very brief period of time. But she is charming and fun and likable in the beginning. Well, let's ask a question, a serious, on a, like, out there on a limb question. Is this movie primarily a hit because of this scene? This is, people do remember this. Like, this and the ending confrontation are basically all people talk about when it comes to this movie. Right. But uh, this is the big thing. Like, it's a great decision to begin the movie this way because it is like that psycho moment, right? Yeah. That's what everybody talks about. And, uh, I mean, we were, when we when we press play to start the movie, like, you look at the poster, Drew Barrymore is on it, right? Everybody knows that this was marketed as a Drew Barrymore yeah. <laughs> movie. Yeah. And I think it's one of those great examples of when, you know, studios were actually bold enough to lie to the audience kind of in the marketing. And it did pay and off in a them. good way. Not like when you hire like a celebrity and feature them prominently in the poster and they're only in the movie for five seconds. Yes. <laughs> or like when you do it to the detriment of your movie. Yeah. Um, like some of the more recent examples I can think of, um, a movie I really liked did this with Blade Runner 2049. That had Harrison Ford all over the marketing, despite him being in the yeah. movie very minimally. I think the movie would have benefited if Harrison Ford just showed up very late into the movie. That would have right. been great. Um, and for the Marvel movies, Civil War, which I hated, even though it's one of the better liked ones, um, that had Spider-Man on every fucking ad for it, even though he shows up as a surprise. Yeah, that was that, they had to let people know that they had Spider-Man now. Yeah, And that it wasn't the same Spider-Man. But at any rate, so I mentioned, uh, the, the, even though this is like a very well-executed scene, this is the contradiction of this movie for me. This, this scene is like a fantastic opening sequence because of how intelligently they, they and confidently they made all these decisions, right? But at the same time, we're already sowing the seeds here for what I find to be a movie that really does not like its female characters. And uh, I, we've talked about this off air and I'm not going to harp on it too much, but the attitude of this movie reminds me of like what I would expect from an incel type of attitude, which obviously wasn't something they were aware of at the time. It's just, it come, plays that way to me right now in 2019. And it begins with several things, Max, that we'll point out in this sequence. First of all, it has to do with the big twist. 
like think of the point of the scene. Yeah. It's a shock for us, the audience. But how do we accomplish that shock? She is the sacrificial lamb for initiating this movie and what it's capable of. You know what I mean? Like you can get this huge impact in this opening, right? But you have to sacrifice this young woman in order to do so. So already it's like this weird thing where the knives are out for her and it's something that we as an audience, it creates the enjoyment and spectacle for us is her death, right? Um, and that's not necessarily something that's specific to this movie. That's something people talk about all the time with slashers. It's a big t- you know, discussion point. Um, however, I think in this opening sequence, it becomes particularly cruel and torturous. And it has to do with this whole idea of the phone call killer, right? Uh, and I think you feel that, at least I feel that way, because it's not just that he's like antagonizing her on the phone. It's like he sets it up as the sadistic game. You know what I mean? Yeah. And um, what, what are the first things he asks her? Do you have a boyfriend? What she say? No. But yeah. we know that's not true. Right? And then they keep calling on the phone. And I think it's establishing her as somebody who is kind of, I don't know, out of her depth, somebody who is capricious, somebody who's shallow, everything that incels think women are, right? Why did she say she didn't have a boyfriend? You know what I mean? That seems like an incel thing for me because it's like establishing this character as somebody, what's that term, micro-flirting? Right? What? Do you know this? Well, I know microaggression, but there's a term micro flirting. I don't. I'm not up to date on my incel. Lexicon. I don't think it's a specifically incel thing, but I think they would they would point to that moment where she says she doesn't have a, a fo- uh, have a boyfriend, right, and say she's micro flirting with this guy because she's a woman who you know has no loyalty or whatever. Okay, well, here's the thing: we've already acknowledged that slasher movies in general have this kind of misogynistic idea like there are back and forth from what i've seen on the feminist merits of the final girl trope right a lot of it has said it's very that, ambiguous yeah this is actually apparently this was supposed to be much more graphic in the original cut um doesn't really need to be it's no still, it doesn't it's, it's still shocking for this early on in the movie. And we'll talk about this movie's generic properties, but I think part of it not being graphic is, is a good call. Not only financially in terms of like the audience they're going for, but like it definitely makes it feel like a different thing. Yes. than like the movies it's commenting on. But getting back to what I was saying, the final girl trope and the inherent misogyny in slasher movies where one of the first people who always has to die is the promiscuous woman right and then the person who has the chance to triumph over the evil at the end is the virginal holy person right so i think part of that is this but also i think because i really like this scene i think it's very well done i think it sets up the movie very well except let's just say her entire family deserves to die for putting the television there what type of psychopath (laughs) puts a television in front of a bookshelf very true. There's no ease of access there. It's a commentary on how television has covered up our ability to read books. <laughs> but Wes Craven is a genius, man. But my main problem with this scene is for, it, this is nitpicky and dumb and slightly okay. cinema sinsy. But this would make more sense if this was a skeet calling and not because in the ter- in terms of the movie, this was Matthew Lillard. This was not uh, Skeet Ulrich. Oh, you mean calling her to get revenge for breaking up with him? Yeah. Yeah. I guess I don't even know if the movie really goes out of its way to say who is the one that did it. But you can infer pretty easily that it's Matthew Lillard based on yeah. what happens later. Yeah. And like at the end, that's another thing I love about this movie is like the two killer thing is a novel approach to this. And right. like if you're doing a movie that's purely based on horror tropes, it's nice to like actually do something different with that rather than just do it for the sake of doing it. Yeah. But cause like Skeet Ulrich is the one that's obsessed with like sex. He and has purity. the knowledge, but here's the thing about yeah. it though, right? It's kind of a mixture of both of them, but what you're talking about, what you're talking about with Skeet is part of why I still feel like the scene is reinforcing that attitude because like, 
what is going, it's not just that she is made a spectacle of her suffering is the spectacle for the audience and for the killers. It's like, she asked like, what do you want? And they're like, I want to see what your insides look like. Yeah. That sounds like an incel thing because it's like this whole idea that women have no depth and that they're like, they're, I, I'm not up to terms on their dictionary, but I bet they have a term for like when women just use their bodies to get whatever they want. And they ha- like, it's the idea that women are privileged in this specifically sexual way that they can just w- like walk through life without any problems. Right. And uh, they have no respect for us men who have all the trouble. Um, and I, you know, I think the scene feels that way to me because it's like this, it's not just that they're torturing her, her over the phone. It's like you, they're going to try to make her feel responsible for her boyfriend's death because she can't answer the fucking pedantic questions about horror movies. Yeah. It's the pedantic part of it that is like internet nerd, internet nerd. You're an internet nerd. Yeah. This kind of predates that though. Yeah. I'm just, I just, I I think it's like, yeah, like we don't have to acknowledge that incels are fucking disgusting wastes of human space, but Right. Well, that I yeah. mean, hopefully everybody would just take that for granted. But yeah, no, the, the, I, I guess that kind of like open, like blatant display of like misogyny has like shaped our view looking back on this movie. I, yet again, I'm going to attribute it. I'm not trying to minimize any inherent sexism in the slasher right. genre. I feel more that this movie is trying to parody and also portray themes in movies that came before it and not fully doing that to the best of its potential. Right. Um, I don't think that it's a secret and I don't think you're implying this either, but I don't think it's like a secret, like look how disgusting women are. They deserve all this shit that they're doing to them. Oh yeah. I don't, I don't think it's like, you know, Oh God. Yeah. I I don't think it's like a dog whistle moment, but I think the movie wants to be more aware of its subtext than it actually is. Like you're saying, I think it has its goals and it kind of executes them, but it, I feel like it's missing something that actually makes it truly subversive in its subtext because what it is, is it's like an abundance of knowledge about the tropes and everything, but it's a lack of awareness is what it is. Yeah. Um, and and really, here's the here's the real thing, right? It's almost like a fanboy where it's like, oh, I know all these like pedantic trivia facts, right? but I don't get the deeper meaning behind it. Yeah, but. yeah. We were making fun of Star Wars earlier. Yeah, Star Wars is the like is the like happy hunting ground of these people. They they can just find a detail about anything and read about it for hours. Um, and I think that's kind of why I like this because like they do it. Kind of is just like I think that's why uh, behind the mask might work better because like. It, Leslie Vernon in that movie, he is portrayed as like a fanboy of Michael Myers. And you have the Jason. distance yeah. from them. He, he is like, yeah. Oh, those are the legends. Like I can only hope to be as good as them. But like <laughs> he, like he acknowledges yeah. them, but he's also like still a horrible person where like these, it's just like, Oh, well, did you know that this happens in Halloween? This is how that like, yeah. Well, what you're hitting upon is exactly yeah. The back and forth that I was having in my mind while watching it this past week. And, uh, you know, like all our movies, you know, none of our opinions are really final. And all of our commentary tracks are about extending a conversation. So I think there's enough ambiguity in this movie that, you know, I might change my opinion about this or that thing. And it might change the way I view the overall subtext of this movie. But watching it this week, it, it I was having this experience that was like exactly what you're talking about. Where the specific separation I was trying to find was like okay, Austin, you're noticing these similarities, but also is it like, is it like the movie enforcing those ideas or is it the characters espousing these ideas? Yeah. Like how much critical distance does the movie have between its own opinion of what's going on and what the characters are doing? And I think the movie is trying to have more critical distance than it actually achieves. And there are a few reasons why, um, and the big reasons have to do with moments like this, I think. And, and we'll come back to it specifically at the end. But for most of the movie, you can ask that question, and it kind of is not entirely sure either way. Um, but the movie, I think, falters in big moments like that because when it actually turns that into a spectacle for us, it's like validating it for the killers. 
Does that make sense? Yeah. So, I, it, it, you know, there's a lot going on under the under the hood in there, but like I think those few moments, it p- comes to the surface, and it's like, you know, I, I feel like you just you maybe need, needed to change a few details or just your approach to how you stage these scenes. It could be the same plot points, but if you change just a few things about the way characters behave or a few lines, maybe it would not it would not feel like the movie is too on board with its characters. Which, by the way, we have the clever setup there for uh, how she's going to keep the killer from stabbing her later on. Yeah, I well, like that. Yeah, su- I like that too. It's a subtle little thing that you might not notice, even notice the first time, but your brain did. That's why I think this movie is still a good movie because you have those solid screenwriting moments, right? Where a lot of solid screenwriting, I think, um, I've learned not just from watching movies, but you know the the small experience screenwriting that I have. It's all like it feels like you're accomplishing so much more when you actually feel like, oh man, I set something up and then I paid it off. I feel like that's a huge part of screenwriting. Yeah. Like if you can and establish not, things. And not blatantly, not just like look at this thing that's obviously going to yeah. be used later. This is the thing that we'll use to destroy the man who is blue who comes from space. <laughs> and then earlier on in the movie, you have a scientist being like, this it's is not a, good for anything. It's not good for anything ex- except destroying humanoid blue things from outer space. But. I mean, it could be like a huge bomb, <laughs> yeah. but we don't need one. Thank God, right? Yeah, that's great. Uh, and then you have uh, Skeet Ulrich, who... Ulrich. Oh, I don't care. Um, <laughs> <laughs> his name is Skeet. I stopped caring after that. God damn it, Max. But he was cast almost exclusively because he looked like a young young Johnny Depp. See, I listened to the commentary track, and Wes Craven denies this. He's like, I. everybody asked me. No. I, like every bit of trivia I found about this movie was said that he was cast ex- almost exclusively because he looks like a young Johnny Depp. I mean, Depp. it would make sense yeah. with, you know, Wes Craven referencing his, like, eating his own tail, right? Yeah. Yeah. You have Nightmare on Elm Street, which was Johnny Depp's first theatrical God, performance. I, I, I wish, I wish there was a reference to the blood volcano. Yeah. I wish he turned into that blood volcano. That's a great that that effect still holds up great. Like there, are, like I don't think the Nightmare on Elm Street first movie is like really truly amazing, but no. that scene and the first kill scene are truly like just traumatic moments. Although, as it's been pointed out, it is kind of silly that the mom walks into that room after he explodes out of his bed and starts screaming. It's like, I I mean she would scream, but it's like, well, you just assume your kid just got exploded into a blood vortex. Yeah. They knew what they were doing when they killed Freddy. <laughs> it's <laughs> like, oh shit! <laughs> but yeah, I, I hear. Here's the thing: that scene, um, I think, is both smart and annoying to me because I find the dialogue to be like grating. It's just that '90s dialogue where it's like, oh god. And we have this like, this is great. Actually, they get they go overboard with his character later on. I would say with just like the pervy sex stuff. And like him, like that's my problem with this. This movie does do a fairly good job of a whodunit type thing. Yeah. With making you think that anybody could be the killer. You think of the dad, the principal, the police officers, like it does a good job of like right. planting red flags with a bunch of people. It goes in a little too hard on him. And like he is one of the killers, spoilers. Right. But maybe Go off a little, like, I like that stuff of just, like, him gaslighting her just a little bit. Just being like, oh, I snuck into her bedroom and you're telling me to leave. And that's fine. I respect your boundaries. I'm not trying to push you, though. So if you feel that I'm trying to push you toward this, I'm not trying to do that. So that's really... I I like, like, the little gaslighting stuff. And, like, him being a shitty boyfriend in that way and any negative reaction she has is her fault and she internalizes that later on. I feel like what we're... And I agree with what you're saying. But yeah. I think to put put a term on it, by the way, there's our first cameo from someone we'll bring up later in the background. Yeah. Um, one Linda Blair. <laughs> she shows up multiple times. Uh, but, uh, oh God, Courtney Cox. Okay. I yeah. mentioned it in the intro. I had such a huge co- like crush on Courtney Cox yeah. because of this movie. Um, I don't know if she does many other movies. And you really don't have to work after being on such a big TV show as friends right yeah but, um 
I like it when she punches people. Anyway, uh, what I was saying was, I think part of the thing with Skeet's character is that it, it might be benefited if he was a little bit more timid. <laughs> you can tell that that extra behind them was like, they were like, don't look in the camera. Don't don't look into the shots. And he's just like looking to the side <laughs> while walking forward. He just has his like finger. He's ex- inspecting his fingernails. And mm-hmm. His hand is like a foot in front of his face. Come okay. on, it can't be that hard. Sorry about that. Go on. No, but I was just saying like it might benefit more if it's like a little bit more timid. You know, if Skeet is a little bit more timid, he'll, he he might sell that, like, he is kind of, if he, if he in the horror movie, less malicious, you know, if he in the horror movie nerd character were kind of morphed into one character, it might've worked a little better because horror movie nerd doesn't do much because like, oh, you mean Jamie Kennedy? Yeah. He doesn't like do much other than just be like, oh, I like girl too, but that doesn't really matter he doesn't get killed he doesn't really like he just expouts expository horror movie stuff occasionally the movie i feel like wants to treat him kind of like a greek chorus yeah more so than the other characters but also that kind of like automatically like you never get the feeling that he could be the killer but also you get the feeling because like but he's also the most qualified to be the killer out of any of them no but he's not and by the way we'll talk about how like the knowledge of horror tropes equals qualifications for killer later but yeah uh like one thing i want to mention before we get too far away from that scene that first opening bedroom scene is really good screenwriting overall because you set up a number of things not only the door but you set up things where it's like you know that is the scene that's going to be repeated in the climax of the movie right where they go have sex but then she learns who the real killer is, right? Um, it's the scene that sort of establishes uh, um, sort of, again, going back to when she's being attacked the first time and then Skeet comes in through the window again. It's sort of this interesting repetition that happens throughout this movie. I don't know. That's just a good scene. Yes. And then we have the introduction of Matthew Lillard and horror movie kid um horror movie kid jamie kennedy matthew yes. lillard jamie kennedy rose mcgowan nev campbell and skeet ulrich yes which is a solid cast although here's the thing i just don't i think the writing needs one more pass because here's the big problem for me is that it's just a little bit too annoying it's just a little bit too annoying for me yeah like this whole scene is just like what are you talking about <laughs> basic instinct fucking it's like, who are, who are, like, part of this, watching it now, it's like, are these people aliens? <laughs> Where did you go after you sliced and diced? Did you talk to your high school friends like that, Max? <laughs> when I was a high schooler in the 90s, yes, I did. Although I appreciate the Jerry Lewis impersonation. <laughs> That's kind of funny. This is like a little extreme where it's just, I don't know. It just needs to be fair. Remembering high schoolers, teenagers are shitty, shitty people. They are. They, they, but this is a movie. (laughs) Yeah. I think that's it. I think like, I'm not saying, wow, it's so real. Cause like, this is obviously like studio dialogue, but like teenagers are shitty people and they will like terrible jokes at people as expenses without considering how, somebody whose mother was terribly murdered a year before right next like, to are them these might people feel. ostensibly friends yeah they don't seem to have any common interests other than they're all attractive like yeah <laughs> i guess that's a lot of movie teenagers but here's the thing though i would never buy that if the if like in a high school situation if you said that and it was like somebody who is like very attractive right yeah those people, I mean, let's not make too many generalizations, but like there's a lot of clickishness that revolves around that in high school in a lot yeah. of shitty ways, um, which is not to say that like to fall into the incel attitude of thinking people who are like naturally attractive when they're 17 have like an easy life. But like, I feel like I just don't buy that. Like, I just don't buy the situation where like people are like, I'm going to say something like this in front of somebody whose mother was murdered last year. In fact, it could be less than a year. Yeah. It could be less than 12 months. It technically is less than 12 months. But. And I don't buy that there would be no social mechanism in place where people wouldn't shame the shit out of that person for saying that. It depends. I don't know. These are like, if we're talking... Like, if, these people aren't social outcasts. Yeah, no, but you they're, know? if they're upper popularity, then movie logic has told me that they're supposed to be shitty people, so they don't really care about... We're never really sure where they fall in the social clique. This movie reminds me a little bit of Wish Upon. 
in a weird way with its high schoolers. It's not the same, but because these are, are characters and those are like, I don't even know. I don't Car- even know what those that are is. caricatures of caricatures of people not understanding what people are referencing. Wish upon. No, those are those are like boomer memes come to life. Those but, are live action baby boomer memes. Yes, in but, Wish upon. Bad, but badly executed. Yeah. Like, but this, I think, has the same sort of attitude where it's like you see a lot of clickishness later on, but it's kind of like the dynamics of it are kind of like off putting to me. I know it's a movie, but like the way they do it is kind of off putting to me. Um, but yeah, here we get our exposition. And this, this whole interlude to me is kind of strange. What do you mean? Just cause not, nothing really happens. I'm okay with that. I I'm like, people are, I, I know you're not the type of person to say that you would need like, why isn't there murder happening? Or like, why isn't this scary? Right. But like, I'm okay with character building moments and I don't think slashers should ever fall into the formula of we need to have a kill every X minutes. Yeah. I guess it's just weird. I know it's like what's really happening here is that she's reflecting on her mom and we're getting this information to the audience, but I just, I find the way it is, it, it's being executed to be a little bit strange, but here's the weird thing that we can start talking about this movie's real genre, right? People would say this is part of like a nineties postmodern slasher, whatever, whatever that means. But clearly this movie began a cycle, right? Of like stuff like you mentioned, or um, I don't know if you mentioned it actually, like stuff like I know what you did last summer. Yeah. Or like, uh, what's that other one? Urban legends or whatever. There's a whole like yeah. slew of movies kind of like this and of, yeah, Beverly Hills own like, yes. type, like slasher movies. And people at the time, like Paulus two thousands again slashers. Pedantic horror movie nerds at the time rejected this movie because they thought it was like a teeny soap opera horror. Yeah. And I kind of actually appreciate that about it. I wish it went more in that direction, actually. Um, because I think you and I, for some reason, have like more of an appreciation for that weird overall cycle of movie. Like I feel like you and I would love to do the craft. Yeah, I was going to say, show. Like, like, wasn't Ski Ulrich also in that? No, he was in uh, Coven. Never mind. <laughs> like, Do you mean Coven? I'm pretty sure it's pronounced Coven. It's a Coven. But of are you talking about Coven, or is there another movie called Coven? I believe there's a TV show, something like that. Well, at any he rate. He was in Something with Witches. <laughs> but, uh, but that's the weird thing I noticed in that scene, is that it reinforces that like kind of YA feeling. It's not the same as YA, but I think the two are connected. And the thing that did I noticed for me is that the thing that makes it feel that way for me is that her character internal drama is not something she reflects upon while just staring at the picture of her mom or something that is like subtextual for her in like the nuance of performance. It's like her internal drama is external. It's like the entire universe revolves around her drama. Yeah. That's something that feels very YA to me. And I think that's a key part of why this movie doesn't quite feel like the movies it discusses because you have that quality where it's like, this is not a movie about a girl who feels a, like alone in the same way. She has a community of people around her, you know, and they're all wrapped up in her drama. You yeah. Know? No, this, yeah. Uh, this entire movie literally does like everything revolves around her drama. Yeah. With, it's, but, it's interesting. And that's, again, that's not an evaluation, but that's like, that's a thing that's like part of that other genre of teen soap things. <laughs> You know, and I think it's, I think it's actually, it was a a smart decision to roll in that direction a little bit more because it makes it, I think you need that for this movie to be successful because it needs, it needs to stand apart from the things it's discussing, you know? Definitely. But this is surprising that like, I don't know, I guess she like, based on how we see her uh, classmates treat her later on in the movie. Like she might be used to this. Shit at this uh, yeah, point. you don't know, uh, and like, there's so much character drama in that way. But also, you know, the other interesting thing about that is, is that that taking it in that direction perfect works really perfectly with like the idea of making it more of a whodunit mystery movie than just a straight up slasher. Yeah, if you had done more of that stuff and just shown how like how generally shitty people in high school are to yeah. each other, and like it literally could be anybody, and anybody could just be taking these pranks too far. Like, yeah, you know. 
Uh, they have a little bit of that in there, but I feel like it doesn't explore it to the extent that it could. Yeah. Instead, they decide to implicate like the principal, like he could have been one <laughs> yeah. doing it. And I, granted, I think those scenes are fun because of the fonds. Yeah. We're, like there's a few moments we didn't mention it earlier, but he like touches her face like he's fucking John Travolta. <laughs> and then the cop, you get a reaction chop of the cop, like giving him the side eye. Like what? Um, that's a weird character. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, I don't think he really belongs in the movie, but, uh, Oh, you know what? I just noticed the cloak that Ghostface has is kind of like sparkly. Well, yeah, it's supposed to be like, that's the whole point. Like we think of this costume, like they sell them as ghost face masks now. Yeah. But these masks were literally available in every Halloween store before this movie came out. So they didn't invent it for this. No, they didn't. That, I was going to say, that's a key part of this, which I was going to bring up earlier. I forgot. Like, I think that works well of just like getting something that was available at every generic Halloween store. Yeah. That's a really smart move. It's just like, yes, it could be anybody. It's just like, yes, anybody can be a, the killer in this movie. Um, yeah. Cause it's supposed to be cheap Halloween material yeah. that like, that's why it sparkles in the light. Cause okay. We're juggling several, several interesting things here. Sorry. I, I want to interrupt this first to mention again, when we're talking about the payoff of that moment, what's yeah. the interesting similarity? Uh, if you're going to talk about what this movie thinks of codes and how slashers work, he's trying to kill her in the same way that her father might quote unquote kill her if he finds a boy in my room. You know what I mean? And she stops him the same way. Kind of interesting. Yeah. Um, it's the same sort of judgment for some type of sexual activity. Of course, she hasn't had sex. So in, in this movie's logic, she she's able to get away here. Um, but like you were saying, I think that's, because I, uh, I was gonna, I wasn't actually sure if this movie designed that mask or if it just utilized it. Um, because I think either way, it's really well done design. Yeah, it's really iconic now because of this movie. Um, but definitely that decision, like you're saying, is really smart because it is playing into that who done it idea. And the real nature of that and why it works so well with that like high school drama is because it, it unlike. The slashers that <laughs> David Arquette. David Arquette is really good in this. I'm not all the performances are great. I'm not like the biggest fan of Skeet Ulrich, although I think, you know, the movie doesn't give him as many opportunities. But I think David Arquette is great. I think Courtney Cox is great. I think Nev Campbell is great. I and think, uh, Matthew Lillard. Yeah. All good performances. Yeah. David Arquette's a little much for me. I'm just like, wow, you think I'm good at things? That's great. But I don't know. I, I guess you can relate to if Courtney Cox came up to you and started flirting with you for information, you'd probably react the same way, but no, I don't know how I'd react. I wouldn't be in that situation. <laughs> you never know. Uh, if, if somebody did that to me, I would say like, I have a podcast and then just <laughs> um, walk away. Excuse me. I have a podcast. <laughs> so with, I have to go record a with podcast. Literally listens. Yeah. With like, multiple listens. <laughs> yes. <laughs> with more than I can count with my fingers. But um, yeah, this movie does have some pretty solid performances. No, uh, I have already gone a little bit of a... Actually, I don't know if we've recorded this, but I love Matthew Lillard. Like his presence in whatever he's in, sort of, he's just happy and... I don't know. I enjoy his presence in most movies and he is usually he usually good at picking roles that appeal yeah. to his very specific set of I'm going to be goofy 90s dude. Yeah. And he's really underrated. Yeah. And I mean, he's been the voice of Shaggy for over a decade now. So now, like, can I interrupt you for one second? Yes. So uh this moment. Look, Kenny. I know you're about 50 pounds overweight, but when I say hurry, Please interpret that as move your fat tub of lard ass now. What the fuck? I think it, I, I think that's more of like a blatant like she missed the interview thing and she fucked up. So she's getting her anger out on her. Cameraman. But the fact that she goes there. Yeah. That again, goes, is like an incel, right? This like you think about it, right? You were talking. You were joking. Like, what if Courtney Cox came up flirting with you for information? Yeah. What does an incel think women do to get ahead in literally everything? Right? Every incel thinks women are opportunistic 
uh, evil succubus, <laughs> succubus beings who will use any advantage they can get from like their looks or their body to dominate the world and create the underclass of men. Um, but the thing is, this movie kind of plays into that. There are a number of scenes where women treat each other like shit in a way that I think comes off as being written specifically by a man. Yeah. You know, um, and, and just that weird put down about the guy's weight and the way Courtney Cox treats that character is kind of, I don't know. It's kind of weird to me. Um, and exactly the extent to which, you know, Sydney will be tortured throughout the course of this movie is something that feels like an incel fantasy. Like the incel doesn't just want to like kill these women. He wants to, again, like at the beginning with Drew Barrymore, I want to see what your insides look like. Like I want to make you feel something because you are a person who has no substance and you're evil. You know, it's weird. That it is, but that I think, there's... I think it's just like incel is the extreme of like modern misogyny yeah um yeah well no there is misogynistic themes in this <laughs> what did you see that subtitle what there's a subtitle where somebody said mutters bitch goddess <laughs> what does that mean who said that she is the bitch goddess the but goddess I, of all bitches but i want that to be in a good way yeah oh that cop extra looked in the camera <laughs> i just noticed that it is fun paying attention to the all the extras. But I mean, look at this, right? So we don't know necessarily. Why that would you have them anywhere close to each other? I mean, it, it is what it is. Yeah. But I mean, let's talk about this dynamic, right? So what's happening here? We don't necessarily know that Skeet is guilty yet, right? Even though he had that cellular telephone uh, that <laughs> clearly incriminates him. Um, we don't know he's guilty, but yet she as the killer says later, fingers him for the crime. Um, yeah. And that's something that feels kind of like judgmental and shitty too. Like there's so many opportunities at which this movie like punishes the Sydney character for her judgment. It's like, well, it wasn't her fault. Like that was deliberate on the part of Skeet because he wanted to frame somebody. But we don't know that yet. And yeah. what else happens? It's the, it would second be the second time she's done it, according to Courtney Cox. So she also, in a weird moment, uh, one of the better actors in this movie. Um, no, I'm saying the original one, like when the guy who... Liev Schreiber. Yeah. Yeah. Like that was Skeet as well. Like that was him leaving the house in the coat. Just but it's like this weird twofold thing where like yeah. she's an idiot who can't make her own judgment, but also she's like the, she's the dumb girl who likes bad guys because they have a quote unquote bubble butt as one of the, as one of those cheerleaders say in the bathroom. <laughs> we do never get a look at Skeet's butt so throughout we, this movie. No confirmation there. We cannot confirm that. Unfortunately. He does not necessarily have a bubble butt. Skeet, if you'd like to come on our show and yeah, confirm for us whether or not you have a bubble butt or at least had one in 1996. We'd be glad to have you. <laughs> we would need photo evidence for that. And then we will mail it back to you with our stamp of approval. Yes. Oh, no, he's going to be on our show. He'll be on yeah. our next episode. But look at this, right? What happens? She punches him, and then this scene is weird. It's like, why do you have two beds in your room? Why, yeah, why do you have this haze Code era bed bedroom? I'm assuming. And why are you five years old? These women are my age. <laughs> First of all, everyone is too old, too old to be high schoolers, right? Yeah. But like, well, that's just sort of a movie thing that you, yeah. you expect. But like, because we forget. What, what is this? This isn't even high schoolers. This is five. Yeah. A lot of people still have stuffed animals hanging around, and it's something to it's something to do on. Do set. they bounce around it with like, with like a ponytail in yeah, like? No, you're, why would you have a ponytail when you're going to bed? That sounds like a terrible <laughs> idea. <laughs> this is a sleepover. <laughs> My bunny is called Mr. Fluffles. Look at this. It's Why like, would you get the phone again? Like you've already experienced phone-based terror. Oh, you've whatever. Yeah, okay, whatever. But I mean, this is the weird dynamic I'm trying to describe. I hope I'm doing it in a clear way where it's like now the killer is trying to punish her for being an idiot who... who who accuses the innocent person, right? But then it tries to have it both ways where it's like, 
but you're also the idiot because you fell in love and had sex with the killer. You literally have sex with killers as long as they're handsome and they have the right eyebrow shape. Well, I think that like the movie's trying to make you feel implicit with judging her at the same time because they're just like, oh, hmm, maybe because how how dare she accuse her boyfriend? Like. He just had a cell phone, and see, he didn't make the call, so it couldn't be him. But maybe at the same time, it's hard for me to react that way because I'm like, you literally lit him like Count Orlock. Yeah, that's the so, thing. Like, I think that's the movie's biggest failing is the fact <laughs> that it like makes Skeet look like a slimy, disgusting monster for so most it, of the movie. Yeah, it makes it hard to be like you're complicit in judging him because it's like the movie is judging him. Yes. It's this weird, th- it's exactly what we're talking about, where it's like the distance from the characters, you know? Which is why I think, yet again, not to just all aboard the shaggy train, but like, <laughs> I think that's why, like, Matthew Lillard being a th- uh, killer at the end, it's like more surprising to me. Because in another type of movie, he would have just died as dumb jock, handsome man who's. A stoner. Yeah. Because he's the most stoner out of all of them. Yeah, but he's also like the physically biggest out of all of them. So he was the oldest. Yeah. He was 26. <laughs> well, that's the thing. We forget like how awkward most teenagers look because their bodies are still growing and they're like janky and lanky and weird. <laughs> that's the real thing about these teenage incel people is like, Oh, all the hot people get attention. Excuse me. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, oh, there's Linda Blair. Bye Linda Blair. <laughs> but <laughs> but yeah. thanks for stopping by. She's like, seriously, why don't you ask anybody who's like 27 if they think they were hot 10 years prior, <laughs> yeah, no. I will burn these pictures. Even if people who peaked in high school, don't think they peaked in high school. Like, <laughs> <laughs> so let's begin to talk about the way this movie sets up codes of other movies. Um, part of my big problem with this movie is the smugness that comes with not having enough distance from its characters because they're so reductive and dismissive of these prior movies that are smarter and better than this movie. Like let's take Halloween because I'm going to say that's the primary text this movie is drawing from. That's the movie that's on the television screen that they're watching at the climax. So yes. I'm going to say that's the primary and it's the one. movie they directly reference the most. Sure. Um, that movie is 100% self-aware of what's going on in a way that a lot of people don't seem to respect. Uh, And I think that movie is like already at the time collapsing the, uh, the, the sort of uh, moral distancing that's going on in that movie that goes on in other slasher movies with, as far as the villain is concerned, it's much more, I think comparable to like something like blue velvet than people seem to give it credit for. Um, it's a very smart movie. It's very self-aware. Uh, but this movie treats it and its other reference materials, some of which are stupid, like Friday the 13th, as all being on the level of Friday the 13th. That's the thing. Which is the failure. So I think this is more of a filmmaker talking about movies they like in the genre while also taking the stupidest qualities of said genre and being like, oh, this always happens in it. Because I think, I might be wrong about this, what I think Wes Craven was trying to do is being like, because if this was supposed to be a send off to slasher and horror movies, as was kind of his original intent. Okay. You're going to tr- try to enshrine what you think is the best example of that and encourage people to go to watch that, which it did. A bunch of people sure. went back and watched Halloween after this movie. I think that they were trying to have their cake and eat it too of just like, look, it's Halloween. This is the best example of that. You should watch Halloween. Right. While also implying that the dumb rules that they come up with apply to a movie as good and thought out as Halloween. And and this is the real problem, too, is that what we're essentially describing is that it takes a single text like Halloween and another discrete single text like Friday the 13th. And instead, what it does is it combines them. and And basically in this movie, the thing is that all horror movies are one text Like, there's no difference between the horror movies they mention. You know what I mean? It might as well all be the same movie. Does that make sense? Yeah, no, it's slasher movie. They don't, uh, yes, they do not account for generic difference, which is more important than generic familiarity. Um, And this is a, here's the other thing about this. If you are going to do a genre to do this with, that mistake is most fatal in horror. 
because of the nature of horror and what it requires for its market and, and how horror movies succeed, you need to get out in front of your audience and show them something they're not expecting. Otherwise your movie is going to fail. So part of the driving force economically of horror movies is at least on some fundamental level, a certain sense of creativity. Yeah. And that means that when you have that, that combined with the low barrier for entry and how little money it's required to make, you have such a wide variety of movies and it's very hard to make blanket statements about the horror genre at large. Even subgenres, just like slashers, right? I mean, what what is the first slasher movie? Black Christmas. A lot of people point to it. Yeah, that movie is about a woman who wants to get an abortion, and her boyfriend is a villain for wanting to discourage her to do that for for doing that. The movie is one hundred percent. This is nineteen seventy four. This yeah. is the very first slasher movie. No nudity. It takes place in a sorority house. And it's about this woman who wants to get this abortion and the movie's 100% on their, her side. So here's the thing when you create, okay, sorry, you go ahead before this scene is over. I just wanted to talk about like, this is the moment where the movie goes too far with skeet. I think I'd agree. Just like where it's just like, uh, why have you been such a lame one since your mom died? Yeah. I just want to like, don't you just want me to finger bang you? Yeah. Come on, man. Can't even do over the clothes stuff. Oh, uh, here's the Fonz. This is such a weird scene, too. <laughs> he yeah. takes out, speaking of blue velvet, these giant fucking shears. He's going to cut their ear off and send it to Kyle McLaughlin. Oh, God. Sorry, we're both hypnotized by the Fonz. <laughs> <laughs> I just, I'm hypnotized by this scene. What, what is, I don't understand. This would be a harassment lawsuit. Mom. The president threatened me with scissors. And he rubbed it on my nipple <laughs> and then dragged it down towards my waist while he talked about expelling me and ripping my insides out. Like, I know that scene was added later on because... Was it? Oh, yeah, that scene and the scene of him dying were added later on because the producers came in and said, nobody's died for fucking yeah. forever. This movie's going to be boring. Sure. And so they, this also, this scene, Wes Craven didn't want in the movie. He well, thought, it makes no sense that there's he a it was killer too, in the bathroom. Well, no, he thought it was just too blatant with the cheerleader dialogue and sort of exploitative of her. What do you mean exploitative? Just like though she's a slut and she's. Well, like, that's the thing we talked over with that Courtney Cox scene. Yeah. That I think is going to be a big thing about why the, I think this movie validates a bad attitude towards women. Um, and it, this scene is really bad because it's, again, this this specifically like male type of scene about women just yeah. fucking hating one another um, for sexist, re- like slut shaming. Right. But it's like, what is what is the what is the, like the emotional heartache going on in this scene? Oh, my mom was a slut. Yeah. You know, this is like the big realization of the movie is that her mom went outside the marriage. And there's so much negative judgment. I don't think so. I think initially there is, but I think it's more like. That's the motivation for all everything. That's the motivation for all the men to be disgusting people, though. It's not like I don't think the movie ever really has a huge judgment on the mom for that. I think it. It's more of men's reaction to the fact that the mom went outside of the marriage. I'll tell you why I disagree as we go. Um, but anyway, I just wanted to finish what I was saying about what, what happens when this movie reduces genre codes to like the most basic superficial elements, right? Is that you essentially create a schematic where you now limit your opportunities to, to be innovative in a postmodern way where it's like, this always happens. This always happens. So now the, the only question you're left with is, do we do that or do we not do it, do that? And it's very hard to be creative in that circumstance. Yeah. And do something that's really innovative. Like when you reduce the question of creativity to are we or are we not going to follow through on these genre codes that, again, we arbitrarily created because, again, we're not talking about one specific movie versus another one in terms of difference. We're treating them all as the same thing. So we're arbitrarily making these rules. You know what I mean? Yeah. 
Well, there's all, and also narrowing them into the boxes can influence movies for a while to come. Yeah. But uh, one thing I don't think we finished saying about why we like the um, the, the who done it part of this and why it works so well with the teenage high school drama is that also in reference to the older genre of films, they're all very dismissive of it. But it, it's ostensibly it's a really good move to be like, oh, these genre cliches that you have so much awareness of are not going to save you. Yes. Your smugness and awareness doesn't make you safe. You think you can dismiss Michael Myers, but you're actually in danger. And that's an interesting idea to play with is to actually, you know, punish the smugness of that they have and their dismissiveness. Um, and you could potentially do that in a way that's very class aware as well, which I know, you know, Wes Craven is maybe a director that his movies don't get as much respect as they might deserve. But one, I mean, what are, what are some of the movies he's made just, well, his previous movie was Vampire in Brooklyn, which is, Yes, uh, <laughs> but aside from that, what else? he did New Nightmare, but he did People Under the Stairs That's, okay, just I've, before this. I've I like that, that movie. I brought that up before because early on in the movie, I forgot to bring this back. Yeah. When I said Wes, Wes Craven doesn't like New Nightmare, I only bring that up because early on in the movie, when Wes Craven is having one of his obligatory I'm Wes Craven moments, it's uh, the it's just like, oh, did you like Nightmare on Elm Street? The first one was great. The rest sucked. I'm just like, but New Nightmare had already come out. <laughs> But at this point, just shitting all over your own movie, Wes Craven. Nah, that's all good. all in jest. <laughs> it is, but I, I like that. The one. weird thing is, I wonder if he continued the thing with Sam Raimi where he put an Evil Dead thing in this movie. You know that, right? They went back and forth where like Sam Raimi ripped a Hills Have Eyes posters and Evil Dead to make it be like this is bullshit, and yeah. then and then uh, Sam Ra- or uh, Wes Craven put Evil Dead on the TV and Nightmare on Elm Street. The Hills Have Eyes is a movie, real quick. It is. That just, like, because you were watched this and you didn't like it as much as you did. Yeah. I think The Hills Have Eyes is the movie that I went back the most after being a teenage boy and watching that and then, like, rewatched it as an adult and just found nothing. I don't really it. remember much about it. I remember it feeling disgusting, which yeah. is interesting in its own way. But mostly I just remember the line where the guy's like, I'll eat your kids. It's, I don't know. And then I say that to. It's a more to, obvious to Texas Chainsaw Massacre. It's like, what if the Texas Chainsaw Massacre could have been if it, it was not a good movie? I don't like the hills. I, I like the idea of people in Appalachia or just the Midwest, like they're being just fucking monster people in the middle of there. But But yeah. Anyway, to finish what we're saying about, you know, the the fact that cliches won't protect you, it really works with that because it's like what it does is it collapses the ironic distance that these characters have to these texts that they're making fun of and dismissing. It's like saying you think you're safe from this, but you're not safe. Right. And the same thing goes with like if, <laughs> the fonts. But the thing goes the with Fonz it, was the killer the whole time. Well, that's the thing. It's like it plays with this idea of who is the killer because it's not like the killer is some other that's obvious and out there. Yeah. You know, the killer is one of you. And there's some complicity that comes with that because it's like not only is it you, you dismiss these horror movies, right? But the killer is one of you and you're incapable of discerning who it is. So in a sense, are you now, you, you are, it's not like you're sharing guilt for their actions, but it's like, why do you think that you're safe and that you're above this? Because you can't tell in, in your own world who is actually guilty of these things. Well, we get a, like the most explicit example of that later when we have horror movie nerd, like literally watching Halloween, just being like, oh, why aren't you turning around? You're dumb. You're going to get it. And there's literally yeah. the killer right behind him. Hey, Wes Craven, how's it going? Hey, this is a janitor <laughs> named Fred. Yeah. They should just cast Robert England. Yeah. I don't know why they didn't. They brought him back for New Nightmare, right? So. Man, Wes Craven wanted a cameo in the movie. Why not? There are, like, do you find that annoying or charming most of the time? What do you mean? Like, like, like a, a blatant, like, because sometimes there are cute, direct, like Peter Jackson's, cameos in the Lord of the Rings like some of them are so subtle you wouldn't be even, even able to notice he's the guy eating the carrot right, right? he's a guy eating a carrot one. he's an uruk in one of them like oh there's be no way to tell yeah that. but like I'm talking about blatant ones where it's just like hello there character that doesn't matter and we'll never see again oh goodbye like I like his uh, cameo in Hot Fuzz do you know what that one is 
at the beginning montage where it's talking about him and what he's done, he gets stabbed by a Santa Claus. Yeah. Yeah. And he's the Santa Claus. That's a fun one. I think even though, you know, I'm not the biggest fan of Edgar Wright's movies because I think he is, I think he is, uh, his movies become nerd reference festivals in a way that is like annoying to me, but I think at least I he get does. That. He, I think, yeah, that's actually, I'm glad you said that. Cause that's the most articulate like way that you've ever said of why you don't like Edgar Wright movies. And I think makes, I've said that before. I don't know. Maybe I just never heard, but like that makes sense why you don't like his movies now. I get that. Like, it's not that I don't like them. It's just, I have a back and forth relationship. Yeah. That sort of thing is, is always, uh, a little bit disappointing to me because it's clearly a very talented director who's a good writer. And yet I compare it to Quentin Tarantino where it's like his movies are nerd reference festivals too. And you guys are obviously very similar, but there's a vast difference in how Tarantino actually treats subtext of what he's referencing. Um, he really thinks it through. His movies are kind of like essays as pretentious as that sounds. Cause he always references these things that he re he digests them and redistributes them and makes you think about what you just, all these other things that he's referencing in a new way. It's interesting. Um, whereas with, you know, somebody like Edgar Wright, it's a little bit easier to just reduce it to just a game of spot. A West, of I spy a West a Carpenter flick or something. A John Craven. Yeah. <laughs> Dario Bava. That'd be the best one. <laughs> That's pretty close. They could cancel each other out. I I would like that actually. If they Mario could, Argento. <laughs> yeah, no. If they canceled out their the shitty parts of each other's films together, I I would be perfectly fine with that. But yeah, so I, again, it is it is interesting that it, dork it collapses the difference uh, and the complicity that when these was characters the, have. When was the last time somebody used the insult dork unironically? Uh, I did. Today. Really? No. <laughs> In what context? Called my boss a dork. <laughs> He's like, Austin, can you uh, run some uh, numbers on those uh, recent jobs that we've been doing? I said, sure thing, dork. You want some numbers, dork? <laughs> so, yeah. Well, uh, we get this scene where, like, we first start establishing the rules. Yeah, this is the other thing, is that yeah. the rules kind of come in a little bit late in the movie. We're already setting up for the climax, right? Because this the movie is essentially going to end tonight yeah. at the party. So we're getting close here. Um, and I appreciate how quickly this movie moves, but I think if it spent more time setting up the rules, that would be benefited, because I was just about to talk about the rules. So... Let's dive into what the awareness of horror movies means for these characters. We've already discussed that the rules themselves can be seen pretty easily as reductive and dismissive and not entirely accurate and how they limit the creative possibilities of the movies, right? But also, you could have had it as this thing where their misunderstanding of the rules is also something that comes back to punish them. But the movie doesn't really do that. In fact... Because, as we'll see later on, the rules are the thing that play a vital role in actually in inspiring this revenge plot. Their understanding of horror is very important to the killings. Because, again, these are the perpetrators of the killings. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Like, it, it's very... Their understanding of the rules is very important to the way they carry out the killings. And it, it's not as easy to say that it's like a cause and effect relationship... But the, the fact is that these, the rules they set up are arbitrary and reductive and smug and stupid. So the thing is, when that movie validates that as the actual thing that causes the killings, it kind of, that's what ultimately collapses any ironic difference it has from its characters. Yeah. For me. Sorry, I was focused on the... On the stupidity of why he's yelling. Why is he yelling? Well, I was focusing more on like the quick whole thing of just like, oh, it's the millennium. Motives are incidental now. What does just, that mean? I think it's just a commentary on just like how the late nineties, like, oh, you don't need motives for horror anymore. It's just, there's some really interesting acting moments in that scene. I'll point out. Yeah. Where we haven't really mentioned the, uh, what people might discuss as the, uh, homoerotic subtext between Matthew Lillard and Skeet Ulrich's characters. Yeah. Um, but I think there's some, uh, quite a few performance bits for it. Both of them have 
if you'll notice, they both have pierced ears, but they never wear earrings, but they both have pierced ears. And there's weird, touchy things they do. Matthew Lillard goes up to Jamie Kennedy and he like tries to poke his finger in his ear. Right. And then, yeah. and then Skeet Ulrich grabs him by the nose. It's kind of like, it's up with, that's almost like a vaudeville comedy. Do <laughs> <type thing. laughs> yeah. it's like kind of strange. I mean, I would like that more if there was more homoerotic subtext, but, um, as it stands, it's mostly just that two dudes plot to kill their girlfriend. Two bros murdering in a hot tub five feet apart because they're not gay. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, But no, that's the thing. Like, I don't know. Matthew Lillard's whole, like, I don't need a motive thing would be much more interesting if it's just like, oh, I was in love with Skeet and I need you out of the way type thing. But yeah, I think that's more of a motive than this movie needs, honestly, if we're going for the deconstructing angle. What do you think about this scene where she's really coming down harder on herself about the sex stuff? I think this is what I brought up earlier, the whole gaslighting. And why is the scream guy in the grocery shop? (laughs) He's running around in his outfit. Well, is that him or is that just some asshole dressed up in that costume? Because I don't know, but if you were somebody dressed up in that costume and the entire town was on lockdown, that's a very bad idea. Yes. I didn't do it. I just was dressed this way and following them in a grocery store. I thought it'd be funny. It's just a satire. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I remember uh, at my high school, we had this thing called Spirit Week where... Jesus, what is this? No, it's just every every day of the... It was supposed to be like school spirit. Oh, okay. And every day of the week had like a different theme. And you dress up in costumes every uh, day. Okay. And they almost ruined it for us the first day because a bunch... Like five kids dressed up like in offensive Mexican stereotype oh. outfits and ran around the school like playing mariachi music and bringing actual bottles of tequila with them. And the, kids did this in my school too. They almost got suspended or they almost got expelled. They did get suspended and they almost canceled the rest of spirit week for See, everybody else. We had, we had a spirit week, but you only dress up like two days. Ah, okay. And there were a lot of things with like, there was the pep rally day, which is you just wear the high school colors, but then there, it was like also like Halloween week. So it's like a Halloween yeah. thing, but you get a lot of groups of people doing things that are just like, Ugh. Um, and obviously high schoolers are shitty. There's a lack of self-awareness, right? Um, but like you would get things of like all these people dressing up as like Native Americans or like things like that. Yeah. It's, Why can't it, you do more fun? Like that's not even like a fun idea or like people wearing like kimonos. I had a lot of groups fun. of girls in like kimonos. And it's like, what even are you? I had You're lot- just Japanese people. That's not a fucking outfit. Yeah. What the hell type of Halloween outfit is that? It's much better to just be like pirates. Yeah. It's a nineties party. We're all wearing denim and slightly nodding our heads along. It's great. <laughs> denim Look at his like MC hammer outfit. Yeah. Matthew Lillard. That's just something he already owned and decided to wear <laughs> on set. That was Wes Craven's. And he's like, oh, I'll put this on you. Uh, I can like, I don't know. If I'm turning on a producer brain, though, I can get why they randomly added the Fawn's death in the middle of there. Because if we are thinking, like, the last death was quite a while ago now. Yeah, it is. It is pretty long. Because, again, this movie, if you really think about it, this movie is not that type of movie. Yeah. It is a teen drama movie. With a slasher, like, yeah. backdrop. But And I think we both agree if it's steered a little bit more into that, we might think it's, like... A truly great movie. Yeah. It is kind of something it feels like we missed out. And apparently we missed out on all the sequels <laughs> as yeah. well. We got four chances. Well, I think, varying degrees I of think success. this movie's moment had passed by the time they started making sequels, even if the sequel came out. Like, they produced uh, it immediately. Yeah, like a heartbeat later. And it came out the following year. And the second one was actually huge. Um, but here's the weird thing about this movie's success. This would never happen today, by the way. This was not a movie that was ever number one at the box office. It made a ton of money, but it actually went out of theaters for a little bit. Then it came back 
I think at the start of like summer, and it just always was hovering at like number two or number three. How come for Jamie just Lee months Curtis and months? All those movies, because she's the scream queen. But actually, the real reason is that she was the daughter of a famous Janet Lee, yeah, who's also a scream queen, who is actually cast for that reason, kind of. That's the other thing. Billy's last name in this is Loomis, which is an obvious reference. Yeah. And that's what I what, what we mean when we say this movie has a uh, an abundance of knowledge, but a lack of awareness, where it's doing the same things that like Halloween did, right? Because at Halloween also, Dr. Loomis is named after Sam Loomis, who is the, you know, <laughs> plank of cardboard, who is <laughs> Janet Lee's boyfriend in that movie, in Psycho. But... Halloween it's is a reference within a reference. I'm not saying it's saying some sort of complex, sophisticated no, thing not. in Halloween by having it be Dr. Loomis, but the idea that like that movie is more aware of its origins than this one is, <laughs> is something that I will hold to or that it actually reflects on its origins instead of just saying Loomis. <laughs> I mean, I don't know. The names aren't super important in this. Also, I'm sorry. Can I just point something out that I fucking hate in movies? Her nipples? Yes. <laughs> I think they're pointing themselves out. Yeah, exactly. And there's no way not to notice it. Yeah, it's no. fucking disgusting. Well, no, it's the camera focused in the center of it. It's not even the camera. It's that, like... Like, do, do women, women just fucking... First of all, why do they have so many eggs in that fridge? You know, that's you just you keep eggs. Whatever. But women don't just, like, walk around with, like, hard nipples all the time, obviously. So when you see that in a movie, it's like, did they, like, say, like, you know what would help here is really if our female actor had, like, really hard nipples and we could see it. (laughs) What the fuck is that? It just, it's like, it's just always, it's always distracting. It's always weird. It's never something that I, like, want to see in a movie. And for a movie that I've been trying to talk about how like okay the sexism is like some of it is a meta commentary and some of it is them trying to grapple with themes i get this character is supposed to be bimbo blonde who dies early on but like but it's like there's a level of when you're playing into your own stereotype that you're yes come involved in the sexism yourself it's part of the whole ambiguity about like my transition from loving fight club as a 12 year old and then not liking it now is that it's like that movie, I think, buys into it. I know what it wants to be. I think it just doesn't do enough to be like, oh, Tyler Durden is an idiot asshole. Yeah. It's too interested in him being cool. It's too committed to that. Well, that's like when you adopt a book like that. But it's just, I, I mean, you're, you're exactly right. The camera is like right at breast level, too. Yeah. It's like, oh, God. See, I remember when I first thought, yeah, when I first saw this, I thought this was going to be like a whole thing where it was going to contribute to the whodunit, where it's just like, oh, she was going to escape with a wound on her arm and then... Right. No. That's the other real thing where, again, this becomes slasher again is because this does not have really like a plot thing. This is all just picking her off. And I think it is... I think, you know, obviously you could talk about a lot about the way slasher sexualize women yeah but i th- i think it's always i cannot think of it an example i mean her nipples are even hard there you know what i mean it's like why are you sexualizing them in their death scene why yeah why is it happening it shouldn't happen i cannot think of an example where a movie actually pulls that off in a way that's reflective or smart it just always feels gross yeah shout outs to that garage yeah garage door motor by the way yeah it's pretty good mm-hmm. Is that the most like creative death in the movie? Yeah, I think so. This is like this isn't a movie that's like It's amazing that nobody saw that on their way out when they all leave. Yeah. Well, they're all comically wasted. Oh no, not this scene. Later on. Gasp. (laughs) 
<laughs> I like that's some I don't know. Not to I like Matthew Lillard. Okay, I'm gonna keep saying that, but like I liked the comical like him pretending not like oh I obviously didn't invite him here to do this <laughs> like it yeah, was, he's it good was actor. charming. I'm not saying he's Oscar worthy. I'm just saying I enjoy his presence and everything he's in. Yeah, he's good. He also el- the he gra- elevates a lot of otherwise unremarkable roles. Yes. Um, also, the greatest lost episode of the Spectator Film Podcast is when we did the Scooby Doo movie and were shocked by how not awful it was. Yes. Good times. <laughs> not even not awful. It's like it was. They it, did things. Yeah. That like it was weird finding out that there was like I don't know. And there, w- there was that one genuinely amazing scene where it's like Freddie Prince Jr. doing the instructional video for the aliens about how to impersonate people. Yeah. <laughs> then he ends it. Word. <laughs> <laughs> Looks right at the camera. <laughs> That's pretty solid. And then my favorite joke of all time, where you got really mad at me because I kept laughing at it. Do you remember this? No, I don't. Melvin do. <laughs> 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 Jesus Christ. Oh god, I love that. Oh god. But no. I, I still I'm Melvin do. I still want to find the R-rated cut that exists in a drawer in Hollywood somewhere of that movie. Because you can clearly tell it was like almost like they were gonna try to be like, oh, everybody who watched Scooby Doo is older now, so we're gonna make like a gang grows up type movie, and then they f- changed that drastically in editing. It's gonna uh, be like What's that? Riverdale. Yeah. <laughs> Edgy art. <laughs> you know what? I would be on board for that. A really trashy Scooby-Doo TV show that's like Riverdale. Well, there's there's a wonderful book that, for at least for the first part of it, called Meddling Kids. It sort of adopts that concept where it's like the crime-solving gang has been dissolved for years. Like, the dog is dead. Oh. One of them, like, died of a heroin overdose. One of them's, like an escaped criminal. One of them is like, they're, they're all just like shit. Now one of them's doing pretty okay, but they all have to go back to the town where they solved their first mystery together. It takes a drastic turn halfway through the book, but it's really, really good. Meddling kids. Go read it. Everybody. That's my book recommendation. Oh, fuck. (laughs) That's a wonderful question, which I'll have to recheck now. But anyway, we're getting the, the sex scene. Sure, it's a movie, Sid. It's all one big movie. Ugh. Yeah. I honestly, Do I you just get don't, it. I don't like Do that. Do you get it? Do you just get don't it? like that dialogue? Because they they're actually in a movie. Did you know that? This is again the thing. I know it wants to be clever. <laughs> I know what it wants to do. It just needs another draft. I think. Gross, 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 gross. Yeah, you don't know where that hand has been. Uh, Edgar Cantaro wrote Meddling Kids. Well, there you go. Published by Blumhouse Books. <laughs> Blumhouse? Yeah. Oh, there you go. <gasps> oh, man. Look at his face. Well, All I those l- veins. I li- no, I like that of just like we see him not reacting to that at all. Where, yeah. Where if this was supposed to be like, oh, he's so happy he finally gets to sleep with her. Like, no, this was all part of my plan. Right. But Which, again, it's part of that weird incel thing where it's like, again, the guy she decides to have sex with is the guy that literally ruined her fucking life by murdering her mother and her friends. Yeah, but... Yet again, I'm sticking with the movies attempting to make you feel bad for judging her along with that but fails with the fact that it makes skeet just a sweaty disgusting monster the entire movie i don't think it fails in terms of how it treats skeet i think it fails in terms of how it treats her like i i just i don't i'm like less concerned with what i think it might be trying to do and it's just like ultimately what you're doing is you're putting this character in a situation where they're constantly being proven that they can't discern anything about other people and that they end up doing the exact same things that become tropes online for insults. <laughs> like, like I'm, I, I'm not saying this movie was made by people who hold those attitudes or anything, but what I am saying is that incels in the, like, I'm not an expert on it, 
Like, yeah. I don't even know how fucking people can read that. They have like their own Silmarillion or whatever. If, you, if of, any of our audiences are interested in the disgusting world of incels, go check out uh, ContraPoints' videos on it. Well, it's a different language. Yeah, no. Yeah. She, she does a good job of explaining incelies. And we have another, the, the most explicit explanation of rules. I actually really like the impor- performance in the scene. Yeah. Just the way they do it. Big no-no! <laughs> <laughs> it's pretty funny. And I, I love the Matthew Lillard moment that's going to come up yeah. when he's like, I wish we had had a scene like this earlier yeah. in the movie where we explain, because I feel like it would go a long way in making the characters more charming. Like, especially this moment. <laughs> <laughs> like, that's no, very... No, yeah, we should have that's had... very fun. We should have had more gang interaction, I think, would have... Because it sells that they're friends. yeah. You know, that's what friends really do instead of introducing them, being really passive aggressive toward one another and being like, what'd you do after you cut up that person? Huh? Yeah. And talking to Sid while she's like, you know, traumatized by her, her mother's death. But, um, but yeah, like, I, again, I'm not saying that the people who made that are in, are incels or the people who enjoy this movie are incels, but like, you know, if you wanted to look into that, you will find that they speak in, tropes they have these tropes of like narratives in their mind of how women behave all the time in life and i guarantee that part of what they do with the, like their own self mythologizing is they ident- they of course they will identify some woman in their life that is just some normal fucking person and then they will make them an evil succubus right and they oh, always yeah. fit them into this narrative and what is this narrative they do things like they what do they do okay what did sydney's mother's do to, to really incriminate uh, Liev Triber. She seduced him, right? Yes. But ostensibly, he's a minor, right? So he, she should be guilty of a crime there. But what happens in real life? Well, the stupid daughter accuses him of being the rapist. And because he was the one that was actually the victim of rape, now that is the same thing that makes him guilty in the eyes of society of being the one that was really the sex offender, but really was the mom who was going outside of the marriage because she was a slut. Do you understand what I'm saying? How I, this movie... I get that. I don't know. I just, I think it's more the movie doesn't dwell on that. I'm not saying that doesn't make it sexist, but I'm saying like it doesn't have time to blame the mom for anything for that i don't know i would say you're right i would say that's part of like the thing we're talking about with like critical distance but it's also like um it's also a thing where it's like because we're supposed to i guess we're supposed to sympathize with the dad because we only see him in a sympathetic context of like oh he's a dad looking out for his daughter right and he's lost his wife but we don't know like how he was to his wife. We don't know why she felt compelled to go outside of the marriage. Like, right. But there's still that latent judgment in this movie, right? Merely by the fact of like part of Sid's character arc is coming to terms with the fact that her mother wanted to have sex outside the marriage. Yeah. Isn't that weird? Like there's so much judgment in that being the character arc thing that it's like, you've already put yourself in a hole where you can't, you can't not talk about it now because if you don't leave it unexamined, it reinforces this really like problematic attitude. Ooh, that's disgusting. There's nothing I hate more than close-ups of people's mouths. I hate you. <laughs> I hate you. I know most people do. I would hate for this to be my job. I want to be a filmmaker. Winds up working for. Gail well, Weathers. Oh God. I hope I don't meet somebody who's like as enchanting as Courtney Cox in real life. And then they convince me to be their cameraman. <laughs> God help me. And then talk to you like <laughs> move your lard ass. Your lard ass now. So here's the thing of just like at this point. Is she really just like, is she actually flirting with him or she is? I mean, they're going to hook up here. I know, but like, but what are, what are, I mean, the weird thing is that it the, came off like really blatantly initially. Like she was just using him like, yes. Yeah, so oh, now you're a gullible young cop, but now I, they're walking away from the scene. Yeah. So it's a, it's a weird ambiguity. I do like the way the movie treats her character sometimes where it's like, she really defends her opinion on, 
the Lee F. Schreiber character when yeah. she confronts Sydney. But again, that comes at Sydney's expense because it makes her look like shit. Also, this movie does flip the script on her being really opportunistic because she seems genuinely interested in the, the one character who, who does seem like an quote unquote innocent yeah. in this movie. Um, but what are they doing? She's leaving the story, but also now they're seeking romance, which is also a thing that incels well, no. will hold against women. And now it's make, putting the children at risk because the cop is not there to watch them. Well, no, he just said that the sheriff radioed that there was a car and do you want to go there? And yeah, he suggested they walk there rather than drive for to be romantic. But she went along with it. I don't know. It's just weird. I do respect her in the first half of the movie. Like, yes, she was right. And I she, do really appreciate what yeah. they do with her character. I wish we had a little bit more of her. And of course, they would go on to be married in uh, real life. Really? Yeah. No. Oh, okay. I don't know if they're divorced now, but I know that uh, poor old Skeet there got, has been divorced twice in his lifetime. But what are you gonna do? You are named Skeet, unfortunately. I feel like if you're going into Hollywood, maybe change your name. But I'm not one to judge. But it's anything that's marketable. Yeah. Neither of us have marketable names because they're just too normal or just not interesting. I mean, why, I changed my why name would tone. you be doing this immediately after you fucked him? Was like, that's the first thing. Like, let's really narrow down if you're the serial killer now. Well, that's the weird question is, what do you think her intent is in this moment? Because if you think that she's asking because she's now suddenly doubting him, I think that would be the movie again, reinforcing a crappy attitude. But there's another possibility with like, if she's thinking of it, trying in a way to genuinely appreciate him. Which I think it's trying to go in that direction a little bit more, um, which I would appreciate in this movie. The fact that the reason she's bringing it up now is because she's not suspicious of him. Yeah. You know what I mean? Maybe not scare intimidatingly at me from over the bed. And then you can't even say that she thought he was entirely guiltless after he did that because she said, oh, my God, before she noticed Matthew Lillard. No, I think, now, I think she noticed Matthew Lillard before the camera did. No, her, camera, her, eyes, her eyes move once you see the shadows in the background. Hmm. Rewind it and watch, folks. At me at Spectator Film Podcast. Also, the, the interesting twist on this, of course, is, um, I mean, it's not like too interesting. It's basically a simple inversion where instead of the, th the sex act being the thing that, that is uh, something that like, so like seals her fate, yeah. right? It is the thing that allows her to perceive who the true killer is. You know yeah. what I mean? And also, like, it's a... Like, like she has to have sex in this movie before she can actually understand who truly is to blame. Yes, and also she has to have sex before they're allowed to kill her in their own little game. Like, right. That's like that's the real reason why Skeet has been wanting to sleep with her the entire movie. Yes. Oh, no. I guess part of the thing we haven't really discussed as much in comparing this to, like, incel tropes is how... We, we need to just get off this. Well, <laughs> I just want to mention one more thing about it is that, like, it's worth discussing how similar all those tropes are to just, like, weird... To, like, documented serial killer fantasy. Oh, well, no. Like, in the first place. The reason that incels come up so often, like, they've been on the internet for a bit now. But, like, the reason is they've been cranking out mass murderers faster than Disney can make Avengers movies. Like, right. It's... And... It's a highly toxic and violent attitude. I'm going to shout out that ContraPoints video one more okay. time. Um, she talks he about... He sent me a link to it. I can post yeah, it in the show notes. She talks about how they share the red pill ideology with right. people in the manosphere, like pickup artists and men's rights Manos? activists. Like... Um, like man, like man, the hands of fate. Nah, uh -huh. um, man. That's what man is. 
the, no man o sphere like just the like sphere of men it's a dumb term it's it's not what they actually call themselves but just men like the ultra masculine type thing but the red pill ideology is shared by all of them oh, i hate these people um and they're so fucking embarrassing they are but the incel whole thing is just like oh one's yeah Women are naturally hypergamous. They try to sleep with people who are more either powerful or attractive than they are by nature. One's yeah, one's place in the genetic like lottery is yeah, genetically determined. So if you're unattractive, women will never want to sleep with you. And because you can never have sex, your life is meaningless. So you might as well just lie down in a rot. And people wonder why this fucking worldview encourages a lot of mass murderers because... Right. It's essentially a death cult at some point where it's just like, oh, I can't, if I can't win in life, I might as well get revenge on the reason that I'll never be happy. Right. But uh, it's, it, it is a disgusting But really, the, the thing is, it's interesting how all those thoughts are things that already existed in, in like, you know, documented serial killer fantasy. Yeah. You know, and, and the idea of like being a missionary, it, like form of judgment against people usually for sexual reasons it's going to come against like women and i feel like it's less similar to things like horror movies than it is to i don't know s- stuff like that like um and the real thing that makes this movie feel like incel more than that sort of thing even though again we haven't really talked about how this movie definitely plays with a lot of ideas coming off the heels of like the satanic panic yeah you know and like they're going to say later horror, horror movies don't make serial killers. They, they just, just make them more creative. Yeah. Right. That's a big thing going on at this time. But the reason why it strikes me more as incels now is the pedantic part of it. These are very pedantic killers. Yeah. You know, and it's, it's not just that they want to punish people. It's that they want to make people try to realize how quote unquote stupid they are, how stupid they are and, and how inferior, how amazing their plan is. Like, yes. I have the best plan ever. I need the cellular. I think if you well, did this it- was like yeah, this movie was dated in like a couple of years <laughs> just because like we have the initials of like the reason that Skeet Ulrich is I mean they just say it so many times. Yeah, well the cellular, but like having a cellular like a cell phone was something to be suspicious about back then because like why are you walking around with a with a mobile cellular telephone? Yeah, because they were super expensive and not really everybody had one back then. Well, that's the other weird thing that, again, we mentioned the people under the stairs earlier. Yeah. Wes Craven is a character who is not without class consciousness in his movies. You know? And this movie sort of leaves unexamined the degree to which all these children come from, like, impressively wealthy families. Yeah. Like, did you see Sydney's house? All of their she houses. She enters yeah. her bedroom from an outdoor patio. Her patio has multiple stories. <laughs> her patio is larger than even like the office I work in. <laughs> Fuck him. What did he ever do except show you undying loyalty? Well, it was dying loyalty, Max. Yeah. You're wrong about that. But um, and we're in the the final action stretch where stuff happens and things. Have you ever watched this movie on Halloween or with a group of people? Um, no. Because actually. I feel like it really would play differently, and I'm not sure. I would be. The weird thing is that this movie is like it's hard. I. It's a weird thing to describe because I wonder how it would play to like new viewers now because it is there's two things, right? It requires a strong awareness of things that preceded it for it to have the full effect. Right? Yeah. But at the same time, it's very much something that benefits from novelty when you're watching this. You know? It's like you want to know about everything came be- that came before but you don't want to know about Scream. Yeah. But the thing is, at this point, where we're 20 plus years on from this movie being released, who is actually in that situation? No, this, that's, I think this movie might be a good intro level horror movie, but also it might get you into horror for some of the wrong reasons. Just like, 
if you do con- like you said, if you do conflate Halloween with Friday the Thirteenth, yes, even if they are commonly juxtaposed next to each other, they're two radically different films and yeah. two radically different levels of quality and filmmaking and awareness. But if you want to know, like. I think this is a good entry level slasher of just if you But who's going to watch this without an awareness of everything else? You know yeah. what I mean? There's no way to watch this with fresh eyes because the only way to be aware of it is through like the internet word of mouth thing that creates movies their audi- how they find their audience now. Yeah. People's going to go- somebody's going to move Google like best slasher movies, right? Which this is on a list of a lot. So I would be curious to see how this plays for a group of people who haven't really seen it before because I reckon that it would be hard to just find that right group of people in the first place, you know? Like, who's going to watch that all those other movies without having an awareness of this one as well? Yeah. And again, this I is, do like this reaction where she like doesn't like choose anybody. Like, I like it as well. There's just like two people yelling at her to make a decision. She's like, no, fuck off. Of course, the movie is again mo- going to momentarily punish for her for this decision the moment she locks herself inside, and we start to see that uh, what's his face is evil, which we're going to see in a few seconds. But I do like that moment in a vacuum too, yeah. right? Um, and it definitely does play to what we were talking about earlier about the like collapsing of distance and how they can't really treat horror movies in this, in this movie as like safe objects anymore. It's the like collapse of being able to say like, Oh, the danger is elsewhere. Whereas in here it's saying, Oh, not only is the danger your best friends, you're going to have to point a gun at them and say, fuck you to both of them in order to survive. So you're going to be made very complicit in the danger that everybody is in. And I like that in a vacuum, but you have to have a critical distance from your cat, from your uh, characters. (laughs) That's such a melodramatic, stupid thing to say. It is, but I like it. It is what it is. What? My sweaty, evil-looking boyfriend was evil? And this is the uh, other real thing we were talking about earlier when we mentioned how, like, this movie ultimately becomes reactionary when it has the awareness of horror movies be the thing that enables this plot. Yeah. Because what the, the twist is like, okay, this movie is saying that the awareness of the tropes won't help you survive, but you know what it will do? It will make you the killer. Yeah. Like she doesn't use tropes in a way that's self-aware to outsmart them because she's aware of tropes. The only way the tropes are used are to help structure the killings in the first place. And that's what you need. And we're again, we, I think we've done a good job of not comparing them too much, but that's where, you know, uh, behind the mask. Yeah. That's where that succeeds because I, we're not going to spoil it, but let's just say this. An awareness of the tropes is a key plot point for the characters at the end that helps them deal with what's going on, and they're not the killers. It's what helps them survive. Whereas in this, the awareness of the tropes is the thing that makes them dangerous in the first place and partly provokes their urge to kill. (laughs) This is probably the most homoerotic thing with them. But where they're standing behind one another and like smelling each other. <sighs> it was so great. Yeah. That. Chortling. <laughs> <laughs> what <laughs> a wonderful subtle. word. Which is true, but he does have a motive. Which is fun. Like, it's weird that, like, Matthew Lillard is supposed to be, like, the Michael Myers killer in this yeah. movie. Because This l- is my favorite line, by the way. And let's face it, Sid, your mother was no Sharon Stone. <laughs> <laughs> what the fuck does that mean? Oh, God. That's so silly. But Matthew Lillard is very sincere in that moment. It's funny. No, but as we said, this is, like, 
the beginning and the end are the highlights of the movie. And right. The evil monologuing followed by the revenge is like, but it's it is also interesting because it's like the subtext for those killings is the same. We get the thing with Drew Barrymore and then the mother. Your yeah. mother, you know, it's not my dad who's at fault. You know what I mean? Did he kill his dad? No, no. But he did kill her mother because the woman is responsible. Oh, this is my favorite. I mean, this is obviously the... Can we get the title in the movie somewhere? (laughs) Uh, Good times. But again, what I said earlier, I think I I still agree watching it this time, where I think the way the movie buys into the fact of it being a big reveal that her mother was sexually promiscuous and the role that played in it is like, it, it too clearly sets it up as like some sort of arc for her instead of just being their insane motive. You know what I think could have helped with that? Yeah. If we developed the father a little bit more. Not, like, made him an abusive stereotype, but, like, if we had moments where he's, like, Sid, like, I know it's been hard for you alone, and I don't want to, like, pretend that things were great with your mother and I before what happened happened. I was distant and stuff like that. That's a really good point. Do something like that. You invest in that relationship. Yeah. Because then it makes... It it not only... Because the way it is right now, the most of the investment in her family, we see the scenes of her reflecting on her mom, which is kind of what you're talking about. But what does that do? That makes her get involved with her mom. And in some sense, in the again, this is what we're talking about, where it buys into the killers because we get that moment with her and the mom. It establishes the connection between the mom and it helps establish the idea of like the transference of guilt, right? Except this, if you also establish the mom in reference to the dad and her and Sydney's character in reference to the dad, you get that transference and a guilt of guilt in a way that is more even doubt and more fair because now you make it also something that she has to work through with her father and you make it a shared responsibility of both of them, not even responsibility, but just something that they emotionally might feel like they're responsible for. Yeah. But because you don't have that with the dad, you just have it with her and specifically you have it with her and her mother's sexual promiscuity which is the real problem the weird thing about this movie is that it simultaneously given the time it came out seems like something that would would be very censored but also would be like it's it's definitely pg-13 yeah I actually don't know. I don't know if this movie's R or PG-13. I think it's... I feel like it's R. Yeah. There's enough blood and guts in it that... But it plays for a PG-13 audience. Yeah. I mean, nowadays, I'm pretty sure it would be PG-13, but... I don't know about that. Our character smoking? Then it's automatic PG-13, <laughs> uh, thanks to Rob Reiner. Or I don't know. If a character smoking is an automatic R, I think it... I don't, I'm not sure now. I just know that it's Rob Reiner's fault. Well, here's an interesting moment. I do like this idea that they're going to work together now, but they also haven't had enough scenes for me to really feel like it earns the moment fully. Yeah. Like, it would be really beneficial if you were able to get a a big turn on the character and, and then had her and Gail really work together to solve that. But then you have to introduce Gail sooner. You have to make that more of a central or just have a couple more conversations with her and Gail or like, yeah, they talk about why Gail's doing what she did. And Gail's like, listen, I know like I've been a bit of a, like I have done this for my career, but like I do genuinely believe this. And like, not even that, because you can have the back transformation. No, but expand the backstory, I'm saying, like with the mother and whatnot, because I know that's a big reveal, but like you already have one big reveal of having two killers, one of them who has literally no motive. Yeah. And you know what? I'm thinking, 
I'm thinking now that we're really hitting upon something that might make the movie more substantial to us is if, you know, maybe you cut out some things, you can cut out like the video store scene where it, you sort of get it, but it's like, why do we need these scenes? Why do you need the video store scene? Why do you need the scenes with the fonts? You can cut some of that out. But if you replace that with stuff that's like really investigating the relationship with the father and also the relationship with Gail Weathers, that becomes more of a backbone. And you can also bring Gail Weathers into something that informs the way she sees her father. Make it more interesting. Spice that up because then these those characters become the moral backbone of the movie when they succeed over these villains. When you focus more on just like the paraphernalia of them referencing horror movies, it just becomes like it's buying into what they're saying too much or more than the movie intends to actually do, you know? (laughs) You're really fucking up this crime scene. Why not? Have a little fun at the end. <laughs> oh, he's so funny, Matthew Lillard. I know, but he's just like, I don't know. Because, like, I guess it's just like, we have this, but, like, this is just like, oh, look, he's evil and wants to kill. But, like, there doesn't seem to be no good reason why Matthew Lillard want to do this. Other than it seems like he's having a good time doing it. Yeah. <laughs> Which is more scary than evil, sweaty Johnny Depp, man. Than Johnny Dope. Ba-dum-tsh. And of course, this is the ultimate uh inversion, right? Of what we've been talking about, the collapse, like the collapsing of like complicity and stuff, where I mean, for some reason she puts on the outfit. But the yeah. point is that not only are, are her friends the ones who are the, the guilty killers and that she'll have to like confront that, it's that she's actually going to have to become the actual killer herself to survive. Yeah. That's a lot of energy you got for somebody who's bleeding out on the floor a couple of seconds earlier. But, well, uh, he hit his second wind. Yeah. Uh, and then we have Jamie Lady Curris literally coming from the TV and stabbing him in the face, technically. Yeah. And I don't know if we mentioned it, but uh, another little visual reference is uh, we mentioned that line earlier, fingered the wrong man. Well, yeah. one thing she does to fight off Skeet Ulrich is she fingers his, like, hole in his chest. <laughs> so now she's fingered the right man. Yay. There was three killers. Or no, she's going to do it now. And again, you could cut out that character, right? Yeah. Why do we need him? He doesn't contribute much. I feel like ultimately that's the joke with his character. Which again, going back to that problem we mentioned of when you reduce things to such a limited scope, you do things that are just like... But you... Oh, there she goes, right? Like I said, you could have uh, combined him and Matthew Lillard's character into one. Right. Because Matthew Lillard is also passionate about horror movies and like you would have cut down some of the scenes in the movie. You could have gotten rid of the video store thing. You would have fleshed out the relationship between four friends now, rather than the two couples and guy who sits next to them for some reason. (laughs) Awkward fifth wheel. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know. Like I said, this isn't a movie I think is perfect, but it's a movie I enjoy for the most part. And now this, this gets a little gratuitous for me where it's just like this happens in movies. Well, yeah, this is definitely, like, a joke moment. Yeah. Comes back to life. This is the other interesting thing that's a real shift for this movie, and I'm not as familiar with the whole cycle of, like, 90s, quote-unquote, postmodern horror movies that are are, uh, similar to this, but I think the real shift that you notice here is that Okay, let me ask you, is, is the Sydney character a final girl? In a way, but... Really, what is final about her? 
Yeah. Final earlier in, in the earlier movies would indicate that it's a, it's a body count thing. You're the last one standing. The last woman standing. Yeah, well, I think a, a whole point is, like, they fail mainly. Like, they kill a fair amount of people between both of them, but, like... Do they? They kill three people in this movie. And then they die. No, they kill at least um, four. Who? Oh, well, they killed a boyfriend. So you kill a boyfriend and Drew Barrymore. Outside of the prologue, they kill how many people? Two? Yes. The cameraman and the principal? Oh, three. Right? Who am I forgetting? Oh, I don't know. Wait, am I forgetting somebody? No. Yeah, two. Cameraman yeah. and principal. So what? Yeah, so yeah. they fail miserably. <laughs> yeah, so like, ultimately, she's not really a final girl. And I kind of appreciate that in a weird yeah. way but it's it, it i'm not sure like truly what the subtextual implication of that would be i guess you could read that in two different ways where she has like a type of oh no they kill uh, rose mcgowan so three people oh right yeah, yeah, yeah sorry um i we just hated that scene so much um but like it's weird because you could look at that i think two different ways you could look oh, at it harvey as, weinstein get out of our movie you're the real killer not interrupt me to bring up harvey weinstein uh, but anyway, so you could look at it two different ways. Either she has a type of support network that's like different or she has to be rescued. I don't know. I think it would be more like of an interesting innovation to me if they actually, again, invested more time in the characters that survive. Yeah. I. There's a lot of things that they could have spent more time with. And I think that some of the dumber moments in this movie could have been cut for that to expand in the backstory. But at the end of the day, I have to remember what um, Wes Craven's intentions were to make like a dumb parody movie of horror. And I think that might've felt out of place to him if he, that was, if his he intent. took it too seriously yeah. in the character department, if he Maybe. tried to flush it out that way. Yeah. So, I think that could be why some of this doesn't work as well. Um, and obviously this movie did succeed financially on its own it's terms. Bombed. Yeah. It's a big cultural reference point. So, you know, who are we to say that you yeah. should have done this or that, but and it saved box, it saved box office horror movies. Like I think we both can agree that seeing a horror movie, eh, I always dismiss that type of attitude because it's like horror movies have been financially popular I know, for but uninterrupted. If not this one, it would have been another one. It needs no saving. I know, but it, this was the one that did it. So yeah. I, I give it credit for that. It, you know what? It started a new cycle, yes. right? And that's its own interesting thing. Um, but yeah, so there's a lot of questions, I think, that are kind of left unanswered about this movie. And I think you can go back and forth about how much innovation it actually does in the way in which it innovates on the things it's referencing. Um, at any rate, I definitely think it's probably the most notable of this entire franchise. So <laughs> unfortunately, I'm sorry if you're big Scream fans, you know, if, if you maybe get in touch with us, but I don't think you're like, you're like, Scream to this. 4 is the, the shit, man. You need to do that. That's the most meaningful movie ever. Now, I'm pretty sure we're done with the Scream franchise. I, I enjoy this. We might do Behind the Mask eventually. I, I think we both like that movie a fair deal yeah, more. That would oh. be pretty interesting. Um, but yeah, so this has been Scream. Max, do you have any final words? I would say I was going to make a bad horror movie reference, but then I think we've dealt with enough of those <laughs> for the night. So, Well, okay then. So you can find this at spectatorfilmpodcast.com or on iTunes, Spotify, or Stitcher. That's where all our episodes are. Uh, we also have social media, but I'm not going to name those. Just go to our website. Just search Spectator Film Podcast on some social media thing, and I'm sure you'll find us. Or scream into the empty void, and maybe we'll respond. <laughs> That's how you get Max to show up anywhere. Yes. All right. Bye, everybody. <laughs> Goodbye. Goodbye.